Thank you for having me here. Um, uh, my name is Lynn, and I am a director of uh, research programs at Google AI. Um, I was here uh, a couple of years ago where I talked about how much uh, being in this position and reaching this position was really about not me, but everybody behind me, meaning all the people who helped me to get to where I, you know, to get to this moment, right? And um, afterwards, I thought about this for a little bit, and of course, all of that is true. Um, but as I've been giving these talks, and I give these talks around the world, I noticed that people were asking me questions like, how did you get your job? And, and after so many of those questions, I started to think, and really kind of react defensively of, in, in, the, in the sense that, are they questioning that it's a fluke that I have this job, that I actually don't deserve this job? And, and you know, that I'm just, um, I don't know, whatever reason, right? Because they weren't asking all the other panelists <laughs> with me. Um, and then I realized actually what that was, was really an opportunity to tell my story about really how I arrived here, because that journey is actually quite interesting. Um, my, my job at Google is super interesting, but how I arrived at Google is also uh, another uh, very interesting life story. Um, but let me just say that I didn't plan on um, working for uh, Google or working in AI or working in tech. Um, I actually planned my life since I was nine years old to be a writer. I, I spent uh, all of my education going towards becoming a writer, because I knew without a doubt, I was the kid who went to the library back when libraries were still very popular and books were very popular, you know, taking out stacks of books, right? And because I, I grew up in Guam and then in Alaska. So these very remote, far reaching, you know, where your your creativity and, and, and imagination were really important to um, transport you to new places, right? So, um, so wanting to be a writer, I also knew that I was probably not going to get a very good job um, with a, an MFA, right? So what I did as an undergrad is I studied as many things as possible. Also because I'm kind of like, you know, a nerd and I, I like to learn many things. So I did double majors and double minors, right? And then the, the ironic part of that is that when I graduated, the jobs that were offered to me were uh, at an investment bank or uh, uh, the CIA or going into publishing. And I really wanted to go into publishing, but they were going to require me to work 50 hours a week, making 17000 a year. And I was like, um, so basically, I was too scared to go to the CIA, so I went to <laughs> banking. And, and I went to banking. And you know what my plan was living in New York, because you know I came from Alaska, right? I came to New York, and it was very magical to be here. My plan was to um, work as much as I could, which was usually about a year, year and a half, save up money, take off, go to a residency, and write. So I kept doing this, did this for a long time. And then one day, the job that I was offered was at Google. And, um, and I actually had a pretty decent job before that. I had actually moved to San Francisco because I found it very expensive to live in New York. And back then, San Francisco was very cheap. Um, um, so I. I, uh, you know, applied, uh, or I applied for, no, actually I didn't apply. I was already at a job and they, the recruiter found my, my um, CV on, I think either Monster or Indeed or one of those on, online um, boards. And, and they, you know, offered to bring me down to the Mountain View campus, the headquarters, which is about 40 minutes away from San Francisco, and to, you know, interview and give me a tour and a free lunch. And I was thinking, oh, how else would I possibly get a tour to Google unless I went through this whole thing? Where I was like, oh, sure, why not? And because I had a job, it was like it was totally fine that whether the interviews failed or not um, didn't matter to me. But I actually ended up meeting some of the most interesting, smart people. And, but I was still happy with my job, and I didn't really want to commute down to uh, Mountain View. Uh, then one day, um, my manager uh, started questioning and started micromanaging my work. And I was like, you know what? I don't really need to take this because I have a job offer from Google. 
and back then, it was actually not as big of a deal as it is now, but it seemed more exciting. So my first job was to uh, with a uh, division of Google called International. So we didn't have all of these offices around the world. The offices were um, on the Google campus, which is um, in Mountain View, as I was saying. And it was in one particular building where all, and you had flags, so all the, uh, uh, we should call it the um, uh, marketing people, the product managers, the localization people, the QA people were all in one building specifically dedicated to international products, right? So, um, so other than my first job, which was really to, it was within the localiza localization department, and it was called uh, international program manager. Other than that first job, every subsequent one I created actually, and this is sort of the beauty of Google. What happens is you start working on something and you see that there's something wrong with the product and other people see it too, but you have an idea about how you can fix it and you convince everybody else that it's a good idea. And then once it actually starts to flourish, it becomes a viable product. And many of Google products, including Gmail, uh, uh, and I can't even think of all the products that came out of this 20% um, idea, right? So, um, I, so I was working on Google Earth, and Google Earth had been a recent acquisition, and uh, and the same people who, by the way, are doing the uh, Pokemon Go uh, with Project Niantic, right? And um, so, with um, with the um, that first job working on Google Earth, which was a downloadable client application um, for uh, regular consumers, prosumers, and professionals. So enterprise, right? So there were three different versions, and then you had the support for um, the uh, uh, Mac OS, you had support for PCs, Windows, and then you also had Linux support. So it was quite, you know, quite unwieldy. Um, but in that acquisition, one of the one of the recent um, mandates we'd had was that um, uh, Eric Schmidt, who was our CEO at the time, wanted all of our products to be internationalized within a month. So uh, basically, in order to do that, imagine all the different UIs and so on, right? And when you're talking about um, uh, geography, it's not just a matter of translation. Um, in fact, uh, names of, of um, cities or, or bodies of water or mountains or borders are highly contentious. And these are, of course, what many wars are, are, are based on, right? So, um, so basically, uh, it was a very hot product, but one nobody really wanted because it was also very, very challenging. Um, but I uh, was given this because somebody was going on maternity leave and, you know, basically at Google at that time, you just you just had so much work, right? It was one of those situations where you could just work all day and never really catch up, right? So with Google Earth, one of the things that was really annoying for the internationalization of, of Google Earth to uh, Russia or or uh, we were going to do FIGS, which is usually the first set of languages that you um, launch to, which is French, Italian, German, Spanish, right? So uh, the the left hand um, navigation bar was hard coded, if, if you know it, so it wasn't flexible. It's hard coded based on the most sort of clicks and queries. So it was really menu items of, uh, I mean, food items um, like fast food. Fast food was one category. Um, pizza was another category. Barbecue restaurants were another category, and Italian was another category. So in theory, that should be fine, right? Because everybody eats pizza and and fast food and barbecue and so on. But what is an Italian restaurant in Italy, right? How do you, how do you, so this coming up with this ontology was something that we really wanted to fix. So I found out that a lot of the data that we were getting was from Google Maps. So I'd worked with the team on um, uh, working with linguists to figure out what should those categories actually be. Right? What are people looking for in these countries? What are the most popular queries around businesses? Right? And so with linguists, uh, we started building up that ontology so it was actually flexible for each country we were launching into. Um, and then uh, as we're doing building up these ontologies, which ultimately ended up uh, to be part of Google Maps as well, um, I moved to Google Maps to, so that it would help uh, the the rest of the uh, the the teams, if you will, right? The rest, uh, everybody else to use this data, right? So working with Google Maps on building these ontologies, I was work I was traveling around the world, 
right? Because you really want to be able to go locally to look at, to see how people uh, call, you know, just to give you an example, uh, a motel in the US is a motor hotel, right? It's something very convenient, it's budget, budget um, accommodations. A motel in Japan or in Brazil, for instance, is actually a sex hotel, right? So it, it, you uh, get charged by the hour. Right. So unless you know this, unless we could actually get this sort of um, localized, it's not going to be the information is not going to be very useful. So, you know, I would go to Japan often. And one of the uh, annoying things for me was that the Japanese maps was all Japanese. And um, part of that was because most of the data at that time was based on uh, the, the license data that other people were producing. Right. And it was what was most rich for that country. Right. So um, from that, uh, I worked with some other people who thought, oh, let's try to fix this in some sort of algorithmic way, right? So I worked with a speech team um, to come up with some sort of pronunciation. So the way you pronounce uh, certain uh, labels or certain words, excuse me, we could actually go ahead and transliterate this into Latin characters, right? And then based on a set, like let's say 20,000, that's sort of a ballpark. I'm not, I don't remember if that is exactly what we did, but based on a small set, we can actually uh, train and, and test whether we can generate these automatically, right? So in Japanese, for instance, you have many different character sets. You have kanji, you have katakana, hiragana, and romanji, right? So you wanted to be able to actually be able to uh, get all of that translated, transliterated into Latin characters so that we can then produce them into other characters, surrealist characters, uh, Chinese, or whatnot, right? So linguists would go through and, and go and transliterate, which is how something sounds, into Latin characters, right? So doing that, we were able to create new labels for maps. And we did a launch. And, and that formed a, a team called Maps Transliteration. Uh, they still continue to do this to, to this day. Um, the next thing was, because I had been working with the speech team on this pronunciation, uh, they actually had just formed. And they were trying to launch. And they were listening to Eric's mandate of launching into uh, 40 languages. So, But there's a big difference between translating uh, a UI and, and actually creating a new language model, right? I didn't know anything about language models, but I did know that when I was traveling for Google Maps, it would, people would say to me, oh, Lynn, you work on maps, right? There's something wrong with my address. It's showing you know, that it's here, but it's really here. Or the, the navigation to get to you know, this, my work is really annoying because it's actually dropping me off at the different entrance, right? That sort of thing. So, and I would, you know, hear this and go back to work and file a bug and to the team. And I always thought, wouldn't it be great if, I, if the people who are using our products could talk to the people who are making, uh, uh, making the products, right? So I found myself to be this sort of conduit, right? So when the speech team said that they actually needed to launch into many of these languages and it required that we collect a lot of data, which is basically acoustic data for acoustic modeling, how words sound, for instance, and um, linguistic data, lexicon, about all the different sort of unique rules for that language, right? So, uh, so basically, uh, what we wanted to do and what the industry before the iPhone, before this was back when we had our very first Google phone, which was called G1, right? Um, we, I, I thought about how, how it had been done previously, which is the work was uh, that people would have a, this is, this is how old it was back before you know, phones, basically, uh, mobile phones. They would, the, the industry was really led by DARPA, which is the military group, right, where, where um, much of the, our technology comes from, right? DARPA did a lot of uh, um, speech and language modeling and so on. And so we really had one or two sort of vendors who did this work for all the different industry um, uh, are, are basically our competitors, right? And um, so the whole process of, of getting um, uh, getting uh, basically phone sound units, voice samples from different people. Um, back in the day, it would be a classified ad in the paper, and somebody would call on their landline and answer questions as a little survey. And uh, then that's how they would get their acoustic data. But the problem is that the frequency, the sound frequency on a landline is different from the sound frequency on a mobile phone. Okay, And also, we also wanted to profile the mic. Right? We wanted our phone to work really well for our products. Right? So I remembered how so many people that I'd met along the way traveling with, on Google Maps 
had told me, and they were told, fans hope, told me different ideas of what they would do, what they wanted, and how they clearly were, one, proud of their language, two, very big fans of Google, right? And I thought, why not actually go bring our phones to our Google fans and have them give us their vo voice samples, as well as their friends and, and, and people within their social network, so that when we did actually launch this app, it would work really well for them, because they give, gave us their voice sample, right? And so that's basically what I did, and that's called crowdsourcing, right? Because before that, it was all done in a very discreet way through a company. And they didn't know, these companies would, did not know um, exactly what kind of queries and words and sound units we were interested in. And by the time we got them all that information, it would take about six months. So the first time I did this, as an example, uh, we went to Thailand. And because Thai was the most difficult and was also going to be really expensive, right? I just, off the top of my head, I think from the vendors, it was going to be like $150,000, right? To get like, I don't remember, 500,000 um, utterances. And we went and taught, worked with a school, and we sort of had this whole training process of how speech technology works. And we uh, selected about 15 um, uh, sort of crowdsourcers, if you will, Google fans, we gave them phones and we paid them for every voice sample they collected. And it, we got everything that we needed within two days, OK? Normally, it takes six months minimum just to get it clear through legal and so on, right? And, and um, then not only did we get this data very quickly, they were completely engaged in the fact that they were part of something. So when the product actually was released, they were super excited. And you know, so it was a win-win, right? So that, um, that idea of crowdsourcing and working with the people you meet, people who are enthusiastic your, of, your, with your, of your product, basically, um, was a way to really uh, connect the people who are building the products the models, basically, in this case, to the people who are using it, right? So that's crowdsourcing. And that, up until I did it, it, nobody had done it before in this industry, right? So uh, you know there were articles about it and 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 so on, and and I was happy because all the people who were participating were also being um, acknowledged, right, for their their help, right? So this went through. Uh, we collected in a couple of, in about three years almost seventy languages. Okay, so we scaled very, very quickly. That's that's almost unheard of. Even our competitors now have not reached where we are with the, the languages, right? So if you think about what that is with voice search, speech recognition, that is the ear of the machine. It converts sound into text. Okay, and then speech synthesis, which is to speak uh, out the actual uh, what you're, what the machine is trying to say, uh, which is TTS, text to speech, is a different animal altogether. Because for ASR, speech recognition, you need as many different variety of speakers as possible. You want to be able to capture all the different accents, all the different ways you would say tomato or tomato, right? You want to capture all of that. For speech uh, synthesis, you actually only want one perfect voice. And you, that perfect voice has to be in a perfect studio, right? With no other sound, right? Because you're not you you you're generating now. So I I also went through at, went with the acquisition. I had built a team of linguists, and we did the collection for that as well. So within the speech team, I worked on the speech recognition as well as the speech synthesis. And then I, if you think about it, what is missing here is now the brain. We need to process all this information the text that's coming in, and then the text that's going to go, go out. So um, I moved to a new team, or I moved to a new organization, which is the, the Google AI group right now, and uh, basically created a team of linguists, because we knew that we actually needed to get more information about the languages, right? And um, before, we'd worked with linguists from a, a pronunciation um, you know, a different linguistic uh, phenomena that happens, right? But now we wanted to actually work with linguists to get understand the syntax, semantics, all the ways the language actually works, right? So, uh, so I created a team called Pygmalion, um, mostly because of you know, I don't remember, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Pygmalion story, but it's really giving. I was going for the My Fair Lady version, right? Which is teaching uh, teaching a machine or somebody who doesn't know proper English. The proper English, right? So there is a Pygmalion team, 
And then we also needed to figure out how to generate the text in a way that was uh, fluid and, and uh, semantically um, um, semantically accurate for each language, right? Because in English, we don't have that many linguistic phenomena compared to like French, for instance, right? How you say whether you're going, whether it's raining in, in um, New York or in Paris, we basically have one preposition, right? And in French, you actually have, depending on many different uh, things, whether it's feminine, masculine, whether the word starts with a, a vowel or an H, the, the preposition changes, right? So we wanted to be able to do all of that. And so we created a team, another team, uh, to do that, that exactly, which is syntactic realization, natural language generation, right? So now we have the ear of the machine, we have the mouth of the machine, we have the brain, and, and, and to do that work, we wanted linguists to work with engineers to come up with those rules, right? So um, in doing all of that, I was also asked, because I had so many people on the ground collecting speech data, right? I was asked to look at a new area, which is an area where we, it's called for low resource languages, where basically um, there's not enough data with web pages so we have to figure out, there are many languages that are really spoken, but they're not written, or there's no standard to how they're written, right? So we wanted to figure out how we can uh, bootstrap uh, our technology, figure out new ways to sort of advance what we were already doing, but not go at it in the same old way, right? Because the same old way would not work because there's not enough data to build the language model, or there's not enough, uh, it's very difficult to find the perfect voice for a particular language. So I, um, we have a, I created a separate team um, uh, for the Low Resource Language Project. And the idea here was that, you know, we have over 90 million users, 90 million, excuse me, uh, 90 million people in Bangladesh. OK, uh, we don't have enough. Uh, there are not enough web pages compared to in, in other languages or in other countries, like compared to English, for instance, right? So um, the question here was, we had the speech recognition from the collections where people were volunteering, but how do we get the speech synthesis? And I had this idea that basically, um, I was watching Saturday Night Live, and there was a co comedian who was mimicking a politician. And he sounded exactly like the politician. And I was thinking about one of the challenges that we have in creating the perfect TTS voice is that if you create the perfect TTS voice, it sounds exactly like a living, breathing person. If you're a company that, it, that has a voice that, that you, that you, that's supposed to represent your brand, to have it mimic a living person can be, you know, uh, a little bit challenging, right? And it, there's there's all kinds of questions around what that would what that may be like. Um, so, for instance, you you want to have many different kinds of voices. You want a human voice, right? So, what I thought would be interesting is why not actually get instead of having a professional um, voice talent because we couldn't really find a voice talent, let, why not experiment with having many non-professional uh, uh, speakers of that language, right? And basically give us a sample and then we could actually blend it and combine it into a, a, the, the, how many um, utterances we need, right? So the old model was using a concatenated model, which means that you needed lots and lots of data at a professional studio, OK? The new way that we wanted to experiment was really blending the voice. We were trying to leverage all the latest neural networks, uh, neural net models that we can uh, leverage, right? So basically, what we wanted to do is uh, we, we did a call out to all the Bangladeshi Googlers, because we knew that they were very big fans of, of Google products being launched into their country, right? So uh, I think about 50 Bangladeshi Googlers uh, were available in Mountain View. Um, we had a little anechoic uh, chamber, little studio there that we could test this with. Uh, the other thing that happened was that a new eventless laptop existed, right? Because before that, all la laptops had this fan, right? Which would interrupt the recording. And now um, we, we, they had this la uh, laptop called the Asus a laptop, uh, which allowed us to actually use the laptop and have a portable studio, if you will, right? So the, the thing is, is that we were creating voices that could be blared, blasted from a studio and it would sound great. But in these countries, we were all actually listening to the voices on a small mobile phone, right? We didn't need that quality. We just, we wanted what was good enough, right? So um, we had 50 Bangladeshi Googlers, 20 of them volunteered. We recorded all of them where they only recorded for about 
I'd say 30 minutes, and um, because if you're if you're not a professional doing this for th more than 30 minutes, you you're all kinds of things happen to your mouth. You're too tired, and, and it's it's there's no point. So we did this, and then we all actually also had um, them rate which voice they thought sounded the best, because for uh, a non uh, Bengali speaker, for instance, you can't really tell. You have to be able to know like what sounds warm and so on. And they chose one of, and it was all done anonymously. We chose one voice, one speaker. And then we um, basically, I think we ended up using 12, I believe, 12 of the um, speakers' data and built with uh, 1,200 lines. Um, I think it was 1,200 lines. It was, it was a while ago. Uh, but in any event, that created a voice using the parametric uh, synthesis uh, uh, route. And um, that was good enough for us to actually launch into um, the Google, uh, you know, uh, onto the Android phones, as well as onto uh, Google Translate. And that allowed us to, again, do a very similar thing, which was to scale, right? So we were doing multi-speaker, single language voices. And then we decided, you know what? There are many people who speak, this, who speak many languages. So why not leverage those sounds that you, you can produce into those many languages, right? So then we went from multi-speaker, uh, to, uh, multi to multilingual, right? Because th languages are, have similarities. Why not bootstrap and learn from other languages, right? So I know this sounds all complicated and super expert, right? But just so you know, I have an MFA. I, I studied, com I had two, I think two years of computer science as an undergrad many, many years ago, right? So I um, had, by this time, I had reached the sort of level right before you become a director. And I was at that level for about four years. And I didn't really want to be a director because I actually just wanted to work, right? And I was afraid that being a director would require me to do all kinds of other things. It turns out it's true. I, I didn't know, nobody told me. It turns out it's true. But then when we had this, uh, when people were telling me how there are not enough women in leadership positions, I didn't consider myself to be a leader. I didn't consider that I would want to actually, quite frankly, be doing this. But the point is, is that um, if I didn't, who, who would, right? And all the people, as I was saying in the last, like all the people who've helped me along the way, I don't just represent myself, I re represent them, right? So um, I felt like I had to take the leap, right? Avoiding it was was becoming a bigger problem than actually trying, right? So I did, and and um, then I but I went through all sorts of of questions of what am I am I expert enough in this? You know, uh, do I have enough expertise? Uh, and now do I have to be even more perfect? Because, you know, I think one of the things that um, we talk about, so a couple of weeks ago, I was at, um, at one of these leadership summits for women, and um, Sally Heckelson and um, Marshall Goldsmith's book, uh, How Women Rise, they just came out with a book called How Women Rise and 12 Habits That Keep Women From Progressing. And, and I think Marshall Goldsmith has, has a book about what got you here will not get you there. And I thought that was really interesting and important because as I was looking through the 12 habits, I definitely embodied all of them. I was just like, oh my gosh. You know, the first one is uh, not claiming your achievements, right? Giving other people your team credit. So yes, that's true. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the other thing, excuse me, the th other thing was about perfection because as you become a leader, you're also managing people. It's about relationships, right? And if you expect uh, perfection from yourself, first of all, you, that's not going to happen, right? If you expect perfection your, from yourself, that critic that you have, that inner critic, that judge, is also criticizing and judging other people, right? And you cannot have a team that's healthy. You don't want to be with coworkers who are always criticizing, who are only picking out and seeing the negative things, right? You want actually the, the exact opposite. You want a coach, you want somebody who's there, whether it's rain or shine, right? So, so very quickly, one of the things I learned was I had to give up the whole idea of perfection and precision, though it is what got me to this this point. It is what got me, you know, promoted to the next level because I was working really hard, because and it and it takes a lot of work. I think most of you guys know this, right? 
I was take, I was working really hard to do this, right? Um, but I think that what's really important is to uh, accept who you are, and 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 part of that is your values, and being authentic, and that is what will help you work with other people because you won't be as critical, right? You will you will accept your own imperfections because those imperfections are also sometimes what helps you get to where you are whether you like it or not. And part of my work with research is that we don't consider failure to be failures, because you need to fail in order to learn in actual language model building, right? You need to know what didn't work in order to figure out what does work, right? So all of that, if you accept that, oh, well, well, you know, we need to actually fail here, then you, you understand that there is no such thing as perfection, right? That's completely in your head. It's a specter that sort of holds you back, right? So the perfection part, I think, is really important to think about. I think it, it's also really important to think about uh, your achievements and, and what you've actually achieved to, to you know, be able to move forward, right? Because that's getting to that next level, right? And then I think the third thing, which I think is really interesting, is um, leveraging your network, right? So. Um, you know, one of the hard things that I've learned is not all women help each other. <laughs> and, and sometimes in tech especially, um, there are sort of the old guards, and it's not always men, right? Um, because for whatever reason, who knows, what, you know, it's, 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 it's cultural, it's, it's whatnot. But the thing is, is that um, it's not a competition. It's very important not to compare yourself with other people. You are only you. Right, and and this is all part of accepting your imperfection, being authentic, understanding your own values, right, and and so you do need to get to that point of un appreciating and understanding who your your peers and your community is, right. So one of the outcomes of that leadership um, um, summit was really coming up with cohorts, right, coming up with not necessarily just one mentor. Mentors are good, definitely. Because you, you may need to ask questions and so on, but a, a group, a group of people who are thinking about similar things, and to be able to sort of bounce ideas off of them and so on, right? And and to uh, because you may be in the position where you need somebody to talk to as well. I think a cohort is really important, and that's something that we could think about. Because the thing is, is that um, it you know I have been an outlier from the from day one. I, I, you know, I'm an immigrant child. I couldn't not work. I had to always work, right? I come from Guam and Alaska. I'm not really, you know, from New York. And I used to, I used to, be, used to be so jealous when I went to NYU and my friends, my classmates would go home for the weekend to do their laundry. I was like, what? You know? And, and so I, I think it's really important to um, accept and understand that we as women in tech are outliers. Um, we no, there there is no status quo really. There nobody has you know uh, drawn a map or a plan for your future to move forward. It's just you and what you want and what motivates you and what's interesting to you. I've reached this position and, um, not because I'm an expert, but because I can see and be creative about how to solve problems that are different from other people. And I and I basically took the risk to take that next step because I thought it might be exciting, right? So follow your heart, right? And and follow and and try to solve problems with other people, and I think that's that's one of the the best sort of uh, uh, lessons that I've learned is that community is really critical to not just um, you know not just us in this room, but it's critical for the, our culture and it's critical for the advancement of women in in tech. Yeah, thank you. I'm not sure what's next. <laughs> yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Melissa. Um, you talk a lot about writing being a former passion of yours. Do you still think about it? I write all the time. Oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> oh, me? OK. Oh, sorry. Um, go ahead. No, go, go, go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hi, um, I'm Kasi Neblet. Um, so you were mentioning a lot about you have these creative ideas, 
but you have a very different background. So I was wondering, how do you go about leading a group of people who are experts in the solution that you're trying to facilitate? Well, I mean, I didn't arrive in my position overnight. I learned a lot along the way. And I think being observant is important, right? Um, the main thing is that if you have a good idea, it doesn't matter who it comes from, right? So, uh, and, and part of uh, being a leader is influencing, right? And, and, and developing the, the, the network and, and sort of collaborating and, and partnerships, right? To get that idea going. So-and-so thinks that this is a problem as well. That, you know, so-and-so, like, let's try this, right? Hi, um, I, I see that um, in a lot of these conferences, there are people that are um, looking for transition. And a lot of us are maybe um, just entering, I, I for one am an, a new person in the world of tech. I feel like I am. Um, and I was wondering from your point of view, um, what do you see when you're facing a group of people that are trying to transition? Um, how, how do you feel, what draws you to um, maybe, like when someone comes to you for um, an opportunity or, you know, like you were talking about cohorts and mm -hmm. um, mentors, what do you, um, what captures, captures your attention? Um, the number one rule that I have when I hire somebody, whether they are expert or non-expert, is passion and motivation. Because if you're not motivated, it doesn't matter how good your skills are, there's no way I can get you to do the work that you need to do, right? And, and so if you're passionate, you're going to already be thinking about these things and motivated to come up with different ideas. So passion is the number one thing. And I say, and you say uh, transitioning into tech, and I understand what you mean from a, a career perspective. But one of the most important things I think everybody should know is that tech is already in your world. You are already in tech. It's part of, it's all over, right? So you, I think we have to start thinking about it a little bit differently and reframe um, it, the difference is what you do from a work perspective to what you are acknowledging in the world, right? Tech is all around us. I mean, we all have mobile phones, right? So figure out what part of it is interesting to you and, and what you don't, you don't mind spending a lot of time doing and, and go in that direction. Hi, uh, my name is Arunima and uh, I'm a grad student. And my question to you is, you mentioned that failures are necessary for us to learn. And I totally agree with that. But what is your advice in the moment when you're facing failure? What is your advice to um, take it in the most positive way and to learn the most out of our failures? I, I think, uh, I think, if you just start to think about, okay, well, what did you learn? What came out of that experience? And what do you want to do next with what you've learned, right? It's, it's just another step. I mean, I think, I think failure is really that it doesn't match your expectation, but you need to sort of reframe your, uh, reset your expectations. Hi. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, so you talked a lot about problem solving. Was there any book that kind of helped you frame how you think about problem solving and also a book that influenced how you make decisions? Hmm. Um, I do a lot of meditating. <laughs> so for me personally, it's not to be so reactive to actually think about it a little bit, but not think about it too long that it's sort of creating a problem, right? Because some decisions need to be made right away. Um, I think problem solving, you know, uh, I, I can't name one particular book off the top of my head, but the book that I was talking about earlier, um, Sally Heckelson and um, Marshall Goldsmith's book about how women rise, I think is really interesting to uh, look at the habits that we form in, in um, getting to a certain level and what you need to change in order to get to that next level, right? Okay. Thank you.